Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday, where we investigate disasters at sea and the impact that they have on the world today. My name is Eleanor. Today, we will be discussing the history of SS Yarmouth, the first ship owned by a Black-owned shipping line, the Black Star Line. Before we dive in, I must inform you. This story does include details of a maritime disaster resulting in the loss of a vessel, racism, discrimination, anti-Semitism, mentions of the KKK, and death that may be disturbing to some audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. Please note before I begin that I am not a mariner or expert in the field of maritime history, but I have done my research and will present the information as I understand it and with accurate nautical terminology. In today's episode, I will be including the basics of nautical terminology in the description for anyone who needs it. In today's episode, we are going to be exploring the history of a ship that is riddled in controversy and mystery, so I will be transparent when the facts are fuzzy. Happy February, everyone! As many of you know, Black History Month is every February, and I believe it is important to look into Black history since it is an important part of American history. I know the subject can be controversial, but I ask you all to please keep discussions in the comments section civil. 99.9% .9 of the time, you guys are extremely kind and supportive of one another in the comments, so I really don't believe we have anything to worry about, but I do have to state this just for the record. Okay, with that housekeeping out of the way, let's get into the story. The history here is so rich and it really shows how far we've come since the late 1800s and early 1900s. To begin, we are going to start with the shipping line that purchased SS Yarmouth, since it was the first black-owned shipping line in existence. This shipping line was the Black Star Line, as well as its successor, the Black Cross Navigation and Trading Company. The Black Star Line was a shipping company founded on June 27, 1919 by Marcus Garvey, a black businessman and organizer of the Universal Negro Improvement Association, as well as other members of the UNIA. It was created to facilitate the transportation of goods and later African Americans throughout the African global economy. Its name is a derivative of the White Star Line, and this was done on purpose. Garvey felt he could emulate the success of the White Star Line. Garvey's Black Star Line became a key part of his contribution to the Back to Africa movement, but it was unsuccessful for most of its lifetime, primarily because of bad financial decisions and frequent infiltration by federal agents. He envisioned a black nation state of black Americans and Jamaicans returning to Africa, though he'd never see this dream realized. The Black Star Line wasn't the only business that the UNIA started. The Universal Printing House, Negro Factories Corporation, and the immensely popular and successful weekly newspaper, Negro World. Black Star Line was a shipping company created for blacks by blacks, and it should have gotten more recognition and success than it had. Unfortunately for the shipping line and its successor, both would be defunct as of 1922. Even today, it stands as a major symbol for Pan-Africanists and Garvey's followers. To clarify, there is a Black Star Line that is the State Shipping Corporation of Ghana, and it is entirely separate from Garvey's. For anyone who is confused, the Back to Africa movement was based upon the widespread belief that some European Americans in the 18th and 19th century United States that African Americans wanted to return to the continent of Africa. In general terms, it was a political movement and it was an utter flop, with very few former slaves actually wanting to return to Africa. Pan-Africanism is a worldwide movement that aims to encourage and strengthen bonds of solidarity between all indigenous and diaspora peoples of African ancestry. And these two movements played a big part in the Black Star Line and consequently SS Yarmouth. That is the Sparknotes version of Black Star Line, and it has a rich, fascinating history. We aren't going to get into all of it today, but we will definitely revisit it in the future. For now, let's get into SS Yarmouth. The ship was built by Dumbarton, Scotland shipbuilder Archibald Macmillan and Son, based on the River Clyde, originally for the Yarmouth Steamship Company of Yarmouth, Nova Scotia, Canada, in yard number 276. Her keel was laid sometime in 1886 or 1887, but the exact date is unfortunately unknown. SS Yarmouth was designed to ferry both goods and passengers, being a steel single-screw steamer that was 220.3 feet long, had a 35.2-foot beam, a 12.7-foot draft, and a depth of 13.3 feet. The ship displaced 1,432 gross registered tons and was driven by steam engines powered by coal, and this power turned her single screw, reaching speeds of up to 14 knots. She could carry 4,000 barrels, and she was equipped with bilge keels to stabilize her. 
SS Yarmouth's bell was cast at the foundry of J.M. Brumall, and because of the design and shape of the bell, researchers speculate it was made in the Philadelphia area, but this hasn't been confirmed. She was designed to be the finest steamship on her route between Eastern Canada and the United States, being launched on February 28, 1887, and first being registered in Glasgow, Scotland by her builder. It took SS Yarmouth about nine and a half days to cross the Atlantic on her maiden voyage, which took place in April of 1887. On May 3, 1887, SS Yarmouth arrived in Yarmouth, Nova Scotia making her first trip to Boston on May 7th, commanded by Captain Harvey Doan and pilot S.F. Stanwood. She would continue running the Yarmouth to Boston route until 1911. There's some business background on Yarmouth Steamship Company, but since that doesn't greatly influence S.S. Yarmouth, we aren't going to cover that today. Sometime in the future, we can revisit that. There is one notable incident in her history to mention, and that is the fact that in Ottawa on April 1st, 1908, the findings of the Rec Commissioner of Canada, Commander OGV Spain, were presented to the Deputy Minister Marine and Fisheries in Ottawa regarding an incident when the Yarmouth was stranded while mastered by Captain McKinnon. His first name is unknown, unfortunately. And this happened in 1907 or 1908. Sources differ on when this took place. The commissioner chastised the captain for his carelessness and underestimating the strong tides. In 1911, Yarmouth Steamship Company's parent company, Dominion Atlantic Railway, was purchased by the Canadian Pacific Railroad, though they continued trading under the Dominion Atlantic Railway name. The DAR, as we will call them, sold three ships and all of their rights to the Yarmouth to Boston service to the Boston and Yarmouth Steamship Company division of Eastern Steamship. And so Yarmouth was reassigned to the Digby, Nova Scotia to St. John, New Brunswick route. During World War I, SS Yarmouth did not see combat, but in 1916, Canadian Pacific Railroad sold the ship to North American Steamship Company and replaced her on the Digby to St. John route with SS Empress. Yarmouth would haul coal between Nova Scotia and Boston for the time being, with NASC being owned by a cotton broker named W.L. Harris, and he'd purchased SS Yarmouth for $350,000 in 1916, which is about $9,530,179 today given inflation. He made back his investment by using her several times for transatlantic convoy routes, though he was more keen to sell the ship to an amendable buyer. And here's where the Black Star Line and Marcus Garvey come in. Marcus Garvey and Black Star Line purchased SS Yarmouth on September 17, 1919, a new company which had only just been incorporated in June of 1919 from the North American Steamship Company's subsidiary, Harris McGill & Company. Black Star Line was of course founded by Marcus Garvey by starting a stock issue at $5 a share, which is roughly $86 in today's money. Garvey was determined to crew SS Yarmouth with an all-black crew, with a suitably qualified black captain, which was very rare to see in 1919, meeting with Garvey and almost immediately being offered the job. SS Yarmouth was now mastered by Captain Joshua Cockburn, a British-licensed master mariner who was born in Nassau in the Bahamas. He'd initially trained in the Royal Navy as a lighthouse tender, but changed career paths to work for Elder Dempster Lines from 1908 to 1918, giving him 10 years experience with freighters taking routes between British and West African ports, especially ports in Nigeria. According to Garvey, he was the first person of color to command a deep sea vessel, and he had Garvey's complete trust. Along with Garvey's trust, he also had great self-promotion, thus earning himself a princely $400 a month, which works out to about $6,862 in 2023. So his first mission, find a suitable vessel, which we know will be SS Yarmouth and broker a deal. Unfortunately, J. Edgar Hoover's FBI, or Federal Bureau of Investigation for anyone unfamiliar with American Federal Police Forces, had already been investigating and infiltrating Garvey's other projects and the Black Star Line. And one of these infiltrators were Dr. Arthur Ulysses Craig. Captain Cockburn took Craig with him to inspect SS Yarmouth. Why? Because Craig was the first black electrical engineer in the United States and was qualified for the inspection. The two men found that SS Yarmouth was desperately in need of extensive, drastic repairs. Her boiler crowns needed renovated and the hull was almost worn out. 
Despite these problems and going against the advice of Craig, Cockburn deemed SS Yarmouth seaworthy and they decided to purchase her, with the Black Star Line needing to dump $5,000 immediately into new boiler crowns before her maiden voyage for the young shipping line. In 2023, that would be about $85,780, so a very risky investment. There is a theory presented by researchers as to why Cockburn would insist on this ship. As we know, Harris was very keen on getting away from SS Yarmouth, and supposedly Cockburn and friends were all on commission. Therefore, the seller had plenty good reason to ignore the Black Star Line's shaky financial credentials and inexperience, which has previously thwarted purchasing attempts of other ships by Garvey and his associates. Though now the Black Star Line had a fiscal hill to climb, and SS Yarmouth was effectively leased to be paid in 10 monthly installments that totaled $165,000 to $168,500. The researchers debate the exact number, and we don't know if any interest was paid on the ship. That would be between $2,788,020 and $2,890,769 today. This was all to be paid before transfer of ownership, and they couldn't afford the 10% deposit, so the agreement was then altered to about $2,000 a month, which is about $34,312 as we know it, which is insane to think about, especially for a shipping line in its infancy. Of course, the founding of the Black Star Line and all of its activities and purchases were political statements. The Negro World, the newspaper Garvey founded that we covered earlier, made quite the show of William Monroe Trotter, a newspaper editor and real estate businessman from Boston, sailing on SS Yarmouth as a cook and waiter on his way to the Paris Peace Conference. Apparently, an indignity had been done to him, and he couldn't receive a passport from the United States government for the trip. However, the Negro world inflated some of these details and blatantly lied about others, as confirmed by Trotter for the Boston Post's July 24, 1919 edition, and repeated for the Baltimore Afro-Americans August 8, 1919 issue, Trotter did travel to Paris as a cook, but not on the SS Yarmouth. Instead, he'd done so on the French vessel L'Encore. Yarmouth would be unofficially rechristened as Frederick Douglass, though the intent to change her registration papers was never fulfilled, and so we will continue to call her SS Yarmouth. Black Star Line made many claims that they were the owners, but unfortunately due to the lease, these claims were not true. Due to the fact that she was on lease before the completion of the terms of sale, she couldn't be officially renamed. She would sail her entire career with British registration and under the Union Jack and Maple Leaf flag because of the financial obligations of her lease not being completed. Her maiden voyage for the Black Star Line under the first black captain was to the West Indies and Central Americas on November 24, 1919. Other than the one Scottish engineer, the rest of her crew was mostly black British men, which was rare and incredible to see. A full crew of black men was unheard of. Her first voyage, a short one before the maiden voyage, was on Halloween in 1919, being launched from the 135th Street dock near Garvey's office to a, quote, glorious send-off of several thousand onlookers and well-wishers, proceeding just to 23rd Street. Garvey was already having funding issues, difficulties arranging insurance for the ship, and the short trip had to be made with complete permission from the ship's owners, so there was a short leash. Her second and considered maiden voyage in November was to Sagua La Grande, Cuba, with a cargo load of cement. On December 5th, upon arriving in Cuba, Cockburn complained to Garvey that white officers had been causing a ruckus and attempted to run the ship aground. Despite this, she was received warmly in port, with local stevedores banding together and investing $250 worth of shares into the new company. She continued on from Cuba to Jamaica and then to Panama, but there was unfortunately no cargo to pick up. When she returned from Cuba, she had a full cargo manifest and passenger list, but because of repair problems, controversies amidst the officers, and a crew shortchanged on wages, the voyage was not considered successful, and she returned home in January of 1920. Her third voyage took place shortly after the enactment of the Prohibition, and it was delivering whiskey from the Green River Distillery in Cuba. She was loaded hastily since the Prohibition Amendment was to be enacted the next day, with Garvey writing the following on the situation. Quote, I was therefore called upon to spend $11,000 for repairs in order to have the ship sail with cargo valued at $5 million. Just a side note here, keep in mind he did state sometime later that it was valued at $2 million, so take both numbers with a grain of salt. 
on which the company was collecting only $7,000 as freight, all because of the disobedience of two officers of the company. Probably due to racism, but note that that theory isn't confirmed. The deal for transporting whiskey was 10% of what it would have cost from the distiller from any other shipping company, and it had oppressive and burdensome full indemnity clauses attached, which was unusual at the time. This entire story so far has been a financial fiasco that's difficult to untangle. SS Yarmouth departed for New York City on January 17th in a hurry. At Cape May off the coast of New Jersey, the cargo shifted and SS Yarmouth started heavily listing. Two days out, it was reported she was about 101 miles out of the port, slowly sinking, sailing erratically with a heavily intoxicated crew. Due to this, the United States Coast Guard insisted on her being towed home. A salvage tug company arrived. That had to be paid for in arrears, but SS Yarmouth prevailed and arrived at her home port under her own power, thus saving her from becoming a salvage prize. As if this financial disaster couldn't be any more crazy, Reverend Dr. R. D. Jonas, also secretary of the League of Darker Peoples, claimed that Captain Cockburn had bravely thwarted a hijacking plot involving a vessel that was tailing SS Yarmouth, and that sabotage of a sea cock, which is a valve on the hull of a ship to permit water flow into the vessel for cooling engines or for a saltwater faucet, was opened by an engineer to purposely start a leak, though these claims were never verified. One account states that Cockburn ordered 500 cases of champagne and whiskey to be thrown overboard to reduce weight, being scooped up by small boats that were, quote, suspiciously nearby. The valuable cargo had not only been enjoyed by the crew, but also pilfered by dockside repair workers, who'd apparently been caught taking 56 bottles. Due to these issues, there was a temporary impoundment of the cargo by government agents. And what did Garvey have to say about this? Quote, I want to tell you that we really have made history, for that whiskey is from the South and it belongs to Southern crackers too. I'm not sure if the term crackers is meant as the derogatory slang here or not, so take that with a grain of salt. At the end of the whole ordeal, Black Star Line would actually end up paying more in damages to the distillery than they were paid for carrying the cargo, and this resulted in a huge financial deficit. SS Yarmouth would sail again after some very expensive and very temporary repairs, though said repairs have been authorized without a quote, and so arguments about overpricing blossomed. These repairs took place in Brooklyn, in the largest sectional floating dry dock at the Morse Dry Dock and Repair Company, with the dock being the largest floating dock in the world, capable of lifting a 725-foot-long, 30,000-gross-ton steamship, or two smaller ships at the same time. Undoubtedly, Garvey probably wished for an alternative arrangement for the repairs, but his hands had been forced by desperate circumstances. They needed SS Yarmouth to make money. She arrived in Cuba again in February of 1920, and upon arrival, the evening news for Havana on February 25th, 1920, claimed that she had been named the Ark of the Covenant of the Colored People and a bright harbinger of better days. I like thinking of her like that rather than a financial mess. She was a symbol for equality far before talks of equality had even started. In April of 1920, Black Star Line purchased their second vessel, the SS Shadyside, which we will cover at the end of the month. This was a Hudson River excursion boat, and they purchased a second yacht, the Kanawa, by early May of 1920. As for SS Yarmouth, her story would end sadly and with a whimper. Upon returning to the United States in May of 1920, she ran aground off Boston. She'd be repaired, and she was supposed to make her final voyage under a new captain to the West Indies. But in the fall of 1920, while anchored in New York, she was involved in a collision. Another ship most likely hit her since she wasn't moving, and she started sinking. She was immediately towed to dock to be repaired. But this was a serious problem. Black Star Line had been functioning in a financial decline for some time, and they'd had to defer payments for SS Yarmouth since their income of about $44,779.71 couldn't match the operating losses of $138,469.55 in the whole. And this didn't include salaries, legal fees, office expenses, and the cost of selling stock. So, Black Star Line was in deep water, and in November of 1921, they were ordered by the United States Marshal's Office to sell SS Yarmouth at a public auction, and she sold for $1,625.
Black Star Line took out an appeal over the decision, but it was dismissed with costs for non-prosecution, a bill later paid by a bonding company since by then Black Star Line would be out of business. SS Yarmouth was taken to the Pottstown Steel Company of Philadelphia, where she was broken up by the company and sold for scrap. As for the Black Star Line, they'd be defunct by 1922, managing to reach ports in Costa Rica, Cuba, Panama, Jamaica, and other countries, but never Africa like they'd originally intended. Though this is the end of SS Yarmouth's story, there's an interesting tidbit here about Marcus Garvey and mail fraud, so we're going to briefly cover that before we wrap it up. Due to mismanagement, Black Star Line collapsed, and Marcus Garvey's unfortunate downfall was utter irregularities in his business dealings that left him wide open for charges of mail fraud. For anyone unaware of the meaning of mail fraud when it comes to the legal system in the United States, I'm going to give a brief definition, but no, I'm not a lawyer and this isn't legal advice. In the United States, a person commits mail fraud when he engages in a scheme to defraud with intent to defraud and uses the mails in furtherance of that scheme. A scheme to defraud means depriving someone of property by deceitful or dishonest means. And this scheme does not need to involve an affirmative misrepresentation of a lie. In modern days, the mail doesn't always have to be used. It could be through a text message or email too. But that's where the term originated, was through the US mail system. If there are any lawyers listening who can define this better, please do so in the comments. The ongoing investigations and infiltrations by the FBI culminated in a trial that was held in New York City, New York, beginning May 18, 1923. This trial would eventually prove to be a source for future researchers and historians of contested and verifiable facts. For example, the subject of the actual value of SS Yarmouth when she was purchased, which is still fuzzy. One of the ship's officers asserted that since the ship had been used in the coal trade, she was, quote, not worth a penny above $25,000, or about $428,897 today. The jury also found her unfit for passenger use since she'd previously been a cattle carrier. Garvey would be charged for mail fraud for having advertised the sale of stocks in SS Yarmouth, which Black Star Line didn't own. He was bailed for $2,500, but Hoover and the FBI were determined to convict Garvey. Garvey would align himself with the KKK, and this caused massive upsets among the black community, rightfully so. He was found guilty of mail fraud and sentenced to five years in federal prison as well as a $1,000 fine, which was much harsher than most sentences given for this crime at the time, and it was more than likely due to an anti-Semitic outburst he'd had in the courtroom toward the Jewish judge. He wasn't an upstanding citizen, but the legacy of SS Yarmouth as the first black-owned ship with primarily a black crew should not be tarnished because of Garvey's outbursts and behavior. SS Yarmouth and her crazy story is one for the history books, and it will be forever riddled with mystery, lies, and controversy. This story was interesting, sad, inspiring, and disheartening all at the same time, and I'm so glad we took a look into it. I hope that we all learned something from this story and that we can keep the story of the Black Star Line alive, since it was still so interesting that this was the first Black-owned shipping line. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday. If you liked this episode and are listening on YouTube, please give us a like, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our channel. If you liked this episode and are listening on Spotify, Samsung Podcasts, Amazon Music, or another podcast service, please subscribe for more content and leave us a 5-star review, as it does help us reach more listeners like you. If you have any ships you'd like us to cover, please leave us a comment and you might hear your favorite ship here on the podcast. Check out our community tab for updates and interact with us. And don't forget to check out our second channel, Speed Force Media. Tune in next Sunday for the story of USS Mason, a destroyer that served in World War II and one of the first warships to have a primarily black crew. Have a great week, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.